Um, the question came up at the end of the discussion as to whether digital humanities are text-based. For me, the answer is quite clearly no. Numismatics is one of the oldest humanities of all, start having a history going back to the Renaissance, and is quite clearly not related to text. And our approach to digital humanities or to the digital world is something very, very different. And I would like to show you something very concrete, some very concrete work that we have been doing with numismatics and how the digital world has completely changed the way we are working. It's mainly about linked open data. Why linked open data? Now, coins are ideal because they are mass products. There are lots of them. And normally they are quite easy to describe. Very much like books, they have an author, they have a publisher, they have a title, and they have a date. And this makes coins an ideal subject for linked open data. Many of you will know the famous coffee cup by Tim Berners-Lee, where he um, defined linked open data. I would like to draw your attention to the bottom two here, the four stars and the five stars. The fourth star is that you use open standards. This is a very, very important point. Sorry, Bill Gates, but we don't like you. And the fifth point, and this is where we are working, is that you are linking your data to other people's data. Um, a project has been up and running now for some five years. If you want to look at this on the web, nomisma.org is the address. This is an international consortium started initially by the American Numismatic Society in New York, but now with a steering committee drawn from America and right across Europe, which is defining the digital numismatic world in terms of linked open data. For example, um, here, if you put in this address, denarius, you get a definition of what a denarius is, this particular Roman coin. But this internet address gives you a handle where anybody who is working with coins can refer to this address, and it doesn't matter what they call a denarius. Here's an even better example, Augustus, you can get multilingual. Um, if you look here, for example, this is Augustus in Inuit. Sorry, let me just come back. So it doesn't matter how people are referring to Augustus or Denarius or whatever, there is always a standard internet address which enables these people to say what it is they're talking about and communicate with each other. Um, we've also linked through to other um, uh, vocabulary, linked open data vocabulary. For example, here we have the Getty um, thesaurus or the British Museum, the French National Library, we are very much linked in to the world. Another aspect is, although we have a definition of what a denarius is and a definition of who Augustus is, these are only words. And if we want to go into the machine-readable world, we need a grammar. We need to be able to link these words together. You, me, dinner is not a very good idea of in a very good way of inviting the love of your life out for a romantic meal. Because it might mean I want to eat you for dinner and not I want to take you out to dinner. So you need a grammar to explain how these words fit together. And so within the Mizma we've also defined an ontology which explains how these various words, concepts fit together. We have classes and we have properties. For example, a denarius has denomination. A coin has an issuer. This is Augustus. And this then takes us into a completely new way of describing material on the web. This is resource description framework, machine readable. This is basically telling me that this particular coin in my database in Frankfurt, this is the internet address for this coin. You type that in, this coin will come up on your browser has the denomination, and the denomination of this coin is a denarius. Now, this language of... Um, let me just come down here. Uh, nomisma... Ah, 
someone has just removed the website. There we are. Okay. Now, Nomisma is being used to power a, a, a large number of resources. I could spend an hour showing to you how this is working and this has changed numismatics. But let me just briefly show you this is one particular type of Roman coin struck in the Roman Republic in 82 BC, you can see here. And this um, resource, Coins of the Roman Republic Online, Crow, is pulling in examples of these coins on the fly. These photos are coming in directly from the websites of the American Numismatic Society, the coin cabinet in Berlin, the British Museum. But this is something that's very interesting for small collections as well, which would otherwise not be visible. Would you go to the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in Charlottesville, Virginia, to look for a coin of this type? No, you wouldn't. Would you go to University College Dublin? No, you wouldn't. But these resources are being pulled up on the fly just by typing in one simple internet address here, which defines this coin type. You can see it here. We can then pull in resources from other websites. For example, there is a, again, a Namisma-powered website of coin hoards containing coins of the Roman Republic. And then I can then produce this wonderful timeline on this map on the right, which gives me the distribution of this coin in particular coin hoards going through the ages. So you can see what possibilities we have of just through this tool, Nomisma, of pulling together websites. I could show a lot more, but I'd like to come back now and show how we, this is Alec Boescher and myself, University of Warsaw and the German Institute, are using uh, Nomisma in order to link together our own work. We're doing this within the framework of a network that was set up four or five years ago, the European Coin Find Network. Um, this is a network of people who work on finds of coins, so we're basically archaeologists interested in coins, right across Europe, from Great Britain through to Romania and the Ukraine. We had our meeting this year in Niborov, in Poland. Poland is certainly one of the anchors of the, of the network. But Alec and I, we are cooperating on a series of databases of finds of, of coins, um, these databases are known as Antica Fundmünzen in Europa, so ancient finds of ancient coins in Europe. And there are three in instances at present. There's my instance in Frankfurt, Alex's instance in Poland, and there is also an instance in Heidelberg. Now, um, sorry, this film has no music. Um, the database, i just sh um, show you how it works. For example, we can bring up a list of find spots of, of, that are in the database. We can go and look at one particular uh, find spot. This is a coin hoard from, to the north of Frankfurt from Nida Girmes, found in 1990. And we have down below a list of coins uh, in that hoard. We now come through to one particular coin. And this we are linking through to Nomisma so that you can, uh, this helps us to link into the, the broader world of numismatics. For example, if you click on the link, you will get the Numisma definition for a denarius. Or if you click on this link, you will get the Numisma definition for Vespasian. This means we can always see that we're talking about the same things when we're using different databases. Probably more interesting than the link to Numisma is how we're linking through to other resources as well and can pull in information which we wouldn't get so easily. For example, the Gazetteer of the German Archaeological Institute, which is geographical, pulls together geographical data. Um, at the top, you have the internet address for Nieder Girmes. And this has a link through to the bibliography of the German Archaeological Institute, Zenon. And this provides me with just two mouse clicks of a full and complete bibliography of everything on this particular find spot that's in the German Archaeological Institute. And this is, in fact, the publication on which the work um, is based on, for, on this hoard in the database. You can actually see the publication on the bottom of the database. So this is how our database links through to the... That's looking good. 
I hope we're going to go on to the next slide. Right, okay. Now, this database is a relational database. It's a very traditional database of tables. It has a table with a list of rulers, a table with a list of, of mints, a list of denominations. But we saw earlier on RDF, Resource Description Framework. If we use that, we can get away from this traditional picture of using a relational database and can transfer everything to RDF. So you map from your relational database onto RDF and you can then use a thing called a Sparkle endpoint. Sparkle is a query language for RDF and um, the advantage of this now is by using RDF is I can then link my database in Frankfurt and Alex's database in Warsaw through a Sparkle interface. I can query these two databases at the same time. And let me show you how this works. There is a Sparkle endpoint which we have, which queries, as I say, the two databases together. Um, at the top, you can tick on the Frankfurt and the Warsaw databases. There is also a very simple drop-down uh, menu possibility to query, but in this case I've put in some com more complicated Sparkle myself. I'm looking, for example, coin struck between 68 and 76 AD, and then I put in the query, and this is now a live query on, well, like when I did the film, on the Frankfurt and Warsaw databases, and we can come down, and I'm getting now a list of coins that fit the question, I, the query I put in from Frankfurt and then from Warsaw at the same time. Um, at present, we only have the two databases linked in together. I also then get a link through here, for example, again, the Numisma ID um, for Rome, so I know what mint I'm talking about. Okay, everyone knows Rome, but there are other mints you won't know about. I can come back, I can again click, what is a denarius? For someone who doesn't know, this is a very useful way of pulling in information. But what is more interesting for us is if I come back and click on the address for my particular coin. Let me just pause the film for a minute. We are no longer in a relation, relational database, but this is a machine-readable description of the coin. This is how RDF works. So this particular coin, AFE1678, has the authority of Vespasian, has the denomination of a denarius, has a starting date of 75 and end date of 75. This is a machine-readable description of the coin and, not, um, and no longer a relational database. And it is through this machine-readable description that I can do all sorts of other things with my Sparkle endpoint. We are going to hope that it comes up. Right, for example, at present the Sparkle endpoint pulls together Frankfurt and Poland. Um, we have the database in Heidelberg. They have no data published online, so they're not in. We're also pulling in a database from Romania. But the interesting one will be this database of coin types from of Greek and Roman coin types from Thrace, which has a completely different structure as a relational database to our databases in Frankfurt and Warsaw. But by mapping the relational database onto RDF, it will then be possible to query it through one Sparkle endpoint. So that through this use of RDF um, and the semantic web, we have this great possibility to pull together all sorts of resources which otherwise could not talk to each other. And this is going to be a really very, very potent tool. And Alec and I are now looking forward to using this basis that has been set up by, well, mainly by uh, the American Numismatic Society and, and a very, very talented programmer called Ethan Gruber, who programs Numisma, and Carsten Toller from the University of Frankfurt, who's been working on our databases and bringing everything together there. Alec and I have just received the wonderful news that we are going to um, have a project financed as part of the, the, the Polish-German Beethoven program on barbarian coins, elite identities, and the birth 
of Europe. Um, and I would just very like, briefly like to show you why do we do all this work with a database? After all, we have research questions. It's all very nice and it's all great fun doing the technical side, but why do we actually do it? Because we have questions that we want to answer. And um, this is then the program, Imagines Maestatis, Barbarian Coins, Elite Identities and the Birth of Europe, run by Alexander and myself. Um, our partners include the, the 3D scan workshop um, at the University of Warsaw and Barbara Wagner from the Faculty of Chemistry, who will be doing metal analyses. From Frankfurt, we also have the Goethe University, the Institute of Mineralogy. Sabina Klein will be doing metal analyses on coins, and Carsten Toller will be doing the database work on it. And this is the team also bringing in externals from Copenhagen, Schleswig, and Dansk. But what are we going to look at, you might ask? We are going to look at imitations of Roman coins produced and found in Northern Europe outside of the empire, in the area known generally as the Barbaricum. These are what the coins look like. They're imitations of Roman coins. Here, some other examples, some copies of Roman gold coins. And we are going to, by looking at these imitations and using the potentials of the database to, to study an area stretching from the North Sea across the Baltic, to the Black Sea, we would be able to look at all of this information in its geographical, archaeological, social, economic context. Because these imitations are a rich source of information on the interaction between Rome and its northern neighbours at an important point in European history, the transition from late antiquity to the early Middle Ages. We are going to use coins to look at identity. Can we identify Germanic centres of power? And how do these centres relate to the groupings that went on to become the kingdoms, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, that succeeded the Roman Empire in the West? We're going to be looking, doing metal analyses to look at the technology, what technology did the Germans, em Germans employ and how did they acquire that technology? This is again a, a very different digital aspect to what many of you think about. But for, within the context of uh, what we're talking about today, the most interesting bit will probably be using imitations in order to understand how to describe non-standard data. Every one of these imitations is unique. There is no standard reference work to which we can uh, refer in order to describe these coins. So how do we model these imitations in the digital world so that we act can actually start to query them, so that we can start to find groups, workshops, networks. And this will be one of the major uh, contributions, I think, of the, of the project uh, beyond the initial research uh, questions is how do we deal with non-standard data and I would hope very much that we can come up with some answers that will help other people. So thank you very much for your attention and I hope at some point I'll be able to come back with Alec and give you some results. Thank you.